watching from Asia, where it's already evening. Thank you for joining us on this um, webinar today. To kick us off, I would like to um, hand us over to Kofi Nyami, who is the um, program director of the MTAPS program. Kofi, can I pass this over to you for some opening remarks? Thanks. Thank you, Jane. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning, this afternoon, this evening, based on where you are. I want to really welcome you all to the first webinar in the MTAPS Pharmaceutical Systems Training Learning Series. Uh, this is a set of uh, uh, webinars that we are putting together as we come to the close of the project uh, to share with all of us the lessons learned and some of the results that we have attained uh, during the time of implementation. This, our first webinar, will look at the importance of pharmaceutical system strengthening for maternal, newborn, and child health. Uh, MTAS program, as you probably may know, uh, is a six-year project USAID funded and that's worked in about 19 countries to strengthen pharmaceutical systems. Their goal is to improve access to and appropriate use of essential of medicines or medical products for that matter. Uh, we focus on five uh, main uh, areas. The first being pharmaceutical systems governance, where we ensure that the governance structures underlying our medical product system, our pharmacy systems, our supply chain systems are optimal. And so the laws, the regulations, and everything that goes with it are in place, and the standards are also in place. We also focus on building institutional and individual capacities uh, for the long term to be able to continue to strengthen and to implement good pharmaceutical management systems. We look at information for decision making within the pharma sector. We looked at uh, pharmaceutical sector financing and pharmaceutical services and supply chain just to ensure that the product is there and they are used appropriately, uh, limiting antimicrobial resistance and ensuring patient safety as we go along. This uh, first seminar in the series we are conducting, we really are aiming to shift the discourse of the role of medical products in national health systems. For a very long time, we have viewed medical products as just a supply chain concern and input to the health commodity. But we really have to consider the quality, the efficacy, and the safety of these products and the extent to which they are used appropriately. There's no point having a medical product that is needed to heal a patient that is used poorly or used badly. The end game, the end goal of the service will not be attained if it is not used right, or if the quality considerations are not maintained, whether in storage or in transit. We argue that any effort to sustainably improve access to and the appropriate use of safe, effective quality medical products requires a systems approach. And we really want to align the systems approach here. In this series, we are focusing on how a systems approach that is so pharmaceutical system strengthening provides cross-cutting benefits for health programs. We are engaging with implementing partners and other practitioners, donors, national government, and other global health stakeholders on the value of pharmaceutical system strengthening for advancing health program goals. We are excited to host this important exchange on pharmaceutical systems and MNCH and encourage you to engage with the panel through your questions and comments in the chat. Once again, thank you. And we hope to gain some knowledge, all of us from here, we learn from you, you learn from us, and to be able to share the message that we need to ensure that the systems are strong to assure availability and to assure appropriate use. I now want to hand over to Jane Briggs, who is a Senior Principal Technical Advisor uh, with the MTAPS project, uh, responsible primarily for MNCH program uh, to take us through. Uh, Jane has been doing this for quite a while. I think she's one of the few that I can say has been older than me in, MN, in MSH. She's worked on this for at least 20, 22 years. So welcome, Jane. Let's take it from here. Thank you, everybody. Great, thanks. Thanks, Kofi. Um, people will be working out what my age is now from what you just said. <laughs> so let's, uh, the Kofi gave a real um, useful sort of setting of the stage in terms of what our project is about and what this learning series is. Um, and I want to start with this um, story, a very tragic story that came from the Gambia to set the stage. In this um, situation, 66 children died unnecessarily because they were given an unsafe cough syrup. Why should this tragedy happen? Why should babies die before we realize that there's a bad medicine in the market? Why are there no systems in place to prevent such incidents? These are the questions to ask. 
And there were breakdowns in the regulatory processes. Medicines of, of poor quality, unsafe, contaminated medicines were imported. This just shows how badly we need strong regulatory systems in our countries to support our supply chain. The system failed these children and their families and the system should guarantee the safety of those medicines, that they're not only available, but of good quality, that they're safe and they're used correctly. And that's the pharmaceutical system. It's estimated that up to 500,000 people are killed per year in sub-Saharan Africa due to fake medicines. And just over under half of those deaths are linked to antibiotics that can be used for pneumonia in children. So countries need a system in place to protect patients from those unsafe medicines. So here on this slide, um, you can see the um, pharmaceutical system components. And when we talk about the system, as Kofi said, it's much more than just the supply chain and logistics, but all the elements that are sure that medicines and medical products are used appropriately. And here you can see the snake pathway that shows all those different components from the manufacturing of the product through all of the processes around registration and regulation in a country, the financing, selecting the products and um, pre-qualifying um, those products, prioritizing them, the whole supply chain of quantification, storage and distribution. And then the last part, which we call pharmaceutical services, which is everything that's needed to make sure that the patient gets the medicine that they need um, and that that medicine is used correctly and it's effective in treating what it's supposed to treat. So in the next slide, um, we just show um, how the pharmaceutical system is a subsystem of the healthcare system. And the pharmaceutical supply chain exists within that pharmaceutical system. Now today we were talking about pharmaceutical system strengthening. Strengthening is not supporting or doing something in lieu, but it's really institutionalizing the best practices to have a strong, resilient pharmaceutical system. And the next slide shows us um, the USAID approach to pharmaceutical system strengthening. And it involves, as you can see from the blue triangles around the side, a variety of different stakeholders, including the users of services as well as civil society. Pharmaceutical system strengthening involves working across the different service um, system components, which are illustrated here in the daisy wheel in the middle. There's governance, human resources, information, financing, service delivery, and all of these as they relate to medical products. And the intersections draw attention to the need to consider the interactions between those components. Now, system strengthening has a long-term horizon as it involves legal and policy changes to make strong, resilient systems. And the problem of that is that it's not a quick fix, and it often is slow to show results. We need to be patient. But the question today is why is pharmaceutical system strengthening relevant for maternal newborn child health? The quick answer to that is that pharmaceutical system strengthening is relevant for all areas of health and groups of populations to ensure that medicines are safe, effective, affordable, and of good quality, and that they're used appropriately for the best outcome. It's been said, no product, no program, but we'd like to go one step further and say no quality product used appropriately means no improved health outcomes. And if we want to attain the health goals of UHC um, and what's laid out in the SDGs, that's only possible if the pharmaceutical system is performant and strong and all components are taken care of as part of the overall health system. Some donors and partners, for example, can be reticent to invest their MNCH resources in strengthening the pharmaceutical system as they don't see the need for it. And we hope that today's discussion will start to confirm that indeed there is a need for pharmaceutical system strengthening for MNCH um, programs. Um, so the last slide now, before we move into the panel, um, just to leave you with one last thought, where would you, prefer to buy the medicine for your child with pneumonia or the oxytocin for your wife in labor to make sure that she doesn't get postpartum hemorrhage? Would you prefer to get it from the drug peddler on the left where you have no idea of the quality and storage conditions of the medicines? The medicines are often more expensive. They're sold in single units rather than a full course of treatment. Or would you rather get it from the place on the right which shows a much more organized controlled setting as a result of a stronger system. 
So the purpose of today is to show specifically that a strong pharmaceutical system is very relevant for maternal, newborn and child health, and to show some examples of progress, but also to talk about the challenges that still remain. So I'm very excited today to present our four esteemed panelists, all from different settings with different perspectives, but they all have one thing in common. They have seen the importance of a strong pharmaceutical system for MNCH outcomes, and they're all passionate about women and children's health. So ladies first, um, we um, are really thrilled to have with us today, Dr. Aline Uimana from Rwanda. She is the division manager of the Maternal Child and Community Health Division at the Rwanda Biomedical Center. Dr. Aline is a medical doctor and epidemiologist. Her background includes experience in malaria, and she was previously director of malaria case management and joined the uh, Maternal Child Community Health Division recently as manager, where her role is to coordinate activities and oversee development of guidelines and policy and, and national level training. Dr. Aline loves sports and is particularly keen on football. Now let's turn to Nepal, where we're joined by Mr. Prakash Dulal. He is a pharmacist, a pharmacy officer and the health directorate of Bagmati province in Nepal. Bagmati is one of seven provinces in Nepal and it is mostly hilly and mountainous. Kathmandu is located in that province. Mr. Dalal has a master's in pharmacy and interestingly his thesis was on medicines in child health. So you can see the connection there. And being based at the provincial level, Mr. Dalal really has a very sort of hands-on perspective and sees the effects of weaknesses in the pharmaceutical system, particularly for women and children who are the main users of the health system, particularly in Nepal as many men are, are away um, working abroad. And Mr. Dalal has a keen interest in research and learning, so he's excited to be with us today. Next in line, we have Dr. Joseph Monahan, who is a public health physician with professional experiences in Africa and Asia. He is currently based at the USAID Global Health Bureau in Washington, DC, where he serves as the senior child health technical advisor at the Bureau's Office of Maternal and Child Health and Nutrition. He's also one of the co-chairs of the Newborn and Child Health Commodities Subgroup of the Child Health Task Force. But Joseph was telling me earlier that um, his first interaction, I guess, with the regulatory system was when he was on a field system, a field visit in Nigeria, monitoring um, the, the partner support to medicine sellers. And after the visit to their first store as part of their um, tour of, of visits that they were doing, the rest of the drug sellers all closed their shops because the word had got around that the visitors were from the regulatory agency on inspection. So he, he saw firsthand the, the fear that regulation and inspection um, gets into these drug sellers, but it's important that that, um, that that fear exists to make people follow the respected, the, the needed practices. And last on our list of panelists today is John Barrazzo. John is the Child Health Director from the USAID Supported Momentum Country and Global Leadership Project. And he's also Lead Advisor in Child Health at Save the Children, based in Washington, DC. Previously, John worked at the Global Financing Facility for Women, Children and Adolescent Health at the World Bank. And prior to that, he had a 26 year global health career at USAID. John tells me that before he entered public health, interestingly enough, he worked in the 1980s in the Kodak Corporation, which is now nearly extinct. And he was told at that time by a colleague who came back from a trade show that, well, the Japanese were showing this digital photo technology, but it will never compete with film. Well, you don't always get what you wish for. Look how things have changed totally around and, and digital technology is for photos is, is part of our everyday life. So um, how this is gonna work, this is a, intended to be a conversation. Um, it's not death by PowerPoint. You have seen the last PowerPoint slide. Um, there will be two rounds of questions with one question to each of our panelists. And then we're going to open up the floor to questions and answers um, from people on the call. So all of you, please feel free to put comments and questions in the chat. We'll be monitoring that. And we'll be picking from those questions um, for the panelists to address. Um, after we've gone through this panel session. So let me kick it off with you, Joseph. Um, given your interest in maternal, newborn and child health programs, 
what do you see as the value of a strong pharmaceutical system for MNCH programs? Uh, thank you, Jane, and uh, thanks for inviting me to come on this panel. Uh, about 95% of uh, maternal deaths in 2020 occurred in countries that are grouped as low and middle income. And uh, from available data, about 800 women die every day following pregnancy or tied births and from preventable causes. Looking at the child health angle, annually, about 5 million children are estimated to die worldwide. That's an estimate of about nine every minute. About 700,000 of these deaths are mostly from pneumonia and other respiratory conditions, and they are mostly preventable or treatable. That tells us the important role of having medicines to help us in addressing these uh, avoidable deaths. So strengthening uh, quality MNCH services remain a priority for USCID, but that relies not just on ensuring the availability of life-saving medicines, such as oxytocin, misoprostol for postpartum hemorrhage, amoxicillin for pneumonia, and also like newborn resuscitation devices for managing bataxphysia in newborns. But it's also important that those medicines are affordable, that countries' budgets can go further, buy more medicines, and that patients pay less out of pocket. For example, uh, most uh, clinical providers and also program managers are aware that WHO has recommended the use of oral amoxicillin for the management of uncomplicated pneumonia and also for managing possible severe bacterial infection among sick young infants. But it will surprise you that many countries do not include this pediatric formulation in their quantification and procurement plans. And as such, a lot of countries don't have these medicines available at all times in the service delivery points. So apart from affordability, it's also important that the medicines be safe and of good quality to avoid the problems of falsified of and substandard medicines. Registration uh, and regulation of medicines are important and also including medical devices. Uh, like you would know also, it's uh, the medical devices are especially important for newborns and are often overlooked in many of our programs. Available data showed that about 10% of medical products that reach users in low and middle income countries are substandard or falsified. Uh, our supported program, the Promoting Quality of Medicines Plus in 2021, uh, carried out uh, a post-marketing surveillance of amoxicillin uh, dispersible in Mali. And from the samples they got, 100% of the samples were not registered. Looking at oxytocin again, poor quality oxytocin is a big challenge in many low and middle income countries. A systematic review that was done in 2016 found that from close to 600 samples that were taken across 15 countries, unacceptable oxytocin content was found in 36% of the tested samples. This is not even related to visual of storage. This is the quantity of the active pharmaceutical ingredient in the sample. More than one third did not have the adequate amount or had too much in that sample. And that is a huge cause of concern. The third angle, apart from affordability, I've mentioned quality and safety, is also the fact that we need these products to be used appropriately. It's important that the appropriate formulations are prescribed and also that they are used in the right dosages. Therefore, in order to ensure quality of care, we need to make sure that medicines are available, affordable, 
they have good quality, they are safe, they are used appropriately, and that counseling is given to caregivers to ensure treatment adherence. In summary, a strong pharmaceutical system is needed in order to achieve optimal quality of care, and investments on MSH programs must focus both on supply and demand for quality health services and products. While the focus on supply chain and logistics is important, it is usually not sufficient because uh, they do not influence all the dimensions of access to life-saving treatment. So I would enjoin all my colleagues to appreciate the importance of investing in all aspects of the pharmaceutical system, not just the procurement or supply chain aspects. And uh, it includes improving registration, improving procurement processes to ensure that women and children receive appropriate life-saving treatment. Thank you, Jean. Over to you. Great. Thank you, Joseph. That was a really nice summary of some of the key challenges and, and why it is um, important for us to consider the pharmaceutical system for MNCH. It can affect women and children's health outcomes. And you talked of the importance of financing in the case of amoxicillin, which is particularly an issue for the community level. You gave us some shocking numbers from our sister project, PQM Plus, demonstrating that quality is a problem and justifies the need for a strong regulatory system. And poor quality oxytocin is obviously not going to stop a woman from bleeding to death after delivery. Um, so thank you very much for um, highlighting that. Um, I'd like now to turn to um, our colleague from um, Rwanda, Dr. Aline. Can I call on you to put your camera on and tell us what effects of strengthening the pharmaceutical system have you seen specifically on health outcomes for women and children in Rwanda? Uh, thank you, Jen and uh, colleague on this webinar. So as an effect of strengthening pharmaceutical system in Rwanda, so we can cite uh, that uh, Rwanda had made a huge advancement to reduce child mortality, in part due to well-established uh, case management system that empower community health workers to manage, diagnose, and treat malaria, pneumonia, diarrhea in children and adults countrywide. So from this, it's made the accessibility of anti-malaria anti drug and essential supplies like uh, RDT, to, which has led to significant reduction of malaria incidence with approximately, that's where we can say that 6% of uh, case, malaria case reports yearly are uh, successfully diagnosed and treated at, within the community. So these have led also to reduction of severe malaria cases and death. So uh, also the other part, it's integration of uh, technology advancement where we are using electronic logistic management information system to request through supply chain of every commodities and this has announced also transparency in pharmaceutical ma management. Also, innovation. this innovation has ensured real-time data visibility, so we know where drugs are, and also prevention of stockouts, minimization of risk of e expiration of all medicine, including for MNSCH products. Like uh, Also, we can mention here that we have uh, dispersible tablets such as uh, anti-malaria drug, the first two edge are uh, available at community level and also at first facilities, posts and district hospital. And this is uh, assuring that compliance to drug for kids is insured. Uh, also, the other point we can say is the establishment of the Rwanda Food Drug Administration, which has facilitated access to high quality uh, drugs. Uh, like also ocytocin, for example, which also helped to, uh, in terms of product registration process, reduction, which helped to a uh, risk of reduction of postpartum hemorrhage, which is reading, is a, among the leading cause of uh, maternal death. And also 
and not when we do see also uh, use of strict deadline for storage, cold chain management, which have been uh, installed, implemented, further enhancing the safety and efficacy of oxytocin throughout the supply chain. And this, uh, every quarter countrywide, there is a supply chain management uh, meet technical working group, which is being done to observe all this and helping the uh, availability of quite, quite this uh, quality drug. It, there is also Rwanda FDA, which is has streamlined importation of drug through an online platform, which is uh, for product registration. And this is shortened of uh, time to get the license, uh, import license to get product in the storage and also do a distribution for the, because through distribution, we do use the active distribution to first arrive. There's also, they have installed the post-marketing surveillance efforts, which have minimized the entry of substandard and falsified products into a Rwanda market. And this really ensure the availability of safe quality, cost effective also maternal and neonatal medical products at all level. And here we can cite also different products there is anti-malaria, anti-tuberculosis, HIV, and the list is huge, as you may, may know. Then uh, in terms of neonatal, we can say also these rigorous uh, efforts have been undertaken to identify and, and also qualify neonatal drugs and the neonatal equipments, where even for the procurement of different machine, let's say like SIPA, concentrator, there is also a big list of uh, technical specification which are made and also in ensuring we have uh, quality machines at all level in very specific, the initiation also help to prevent death throughout provisional of critical equipment and continuous monitoring as at every point we do have biomedical technicians trained to observe also how machines are being used to maintain them for uh, further quality use and life uh, to extend their life use of those of equipment. A comprehensive approach for improving all those care have involved developing guidelines for the oxygen supply chain, establishing protocol for maintenance, specialized training of all biomedical engineering within the hospital, initiative contribute for management of neonatal equipment, and these have helped also to further reduce neonatal mortality rates countrywide. Thank you, Jen, and the audience for your uh, participation and your insights, uh, question are welcome, over. Thank you very much, Dr. Aline, and, and wow, great to see such a variety of different interventions that Rwanda has put in place to strengthen the pharmaceutical system um, and to, to see the, the, the reductions in child and maternal mortality that they have seen over the last few years. I mean, it's nice that you pointed out the role of, of equipment and medical devices that is considered part of the pharmaceutical system because you need medical devices either for administering treatment or for diagnosis. Um, so that's good that you you highlighted that and you talked about the capacity building and, and creation so that the government will to create the Rwanda FDA um, in the beginning. So some really nice examples. I'm sure there'll be lots of um, questions for you um, coming up in the chat, Dr. Aline, so keep your eye on that and we'll put those to you later on in the questions and answer section. So now um, from that national level perspective of Dr. Aline to the provincial perspective um, in Nepal. So Mr. Dulal, um, I don't know whether you can put your camera on as well so that the um, people on the call can see you. It would be great if you could tell us a little bit about the effect of some of the work that's been going on in Nepal to strengthen the pharmaceutical system. What effect this has had on health services to women and children. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for inviting me in this webinar today. And I'm very pleased that I'm delivering something from Nepal and mostly uh, majorly, I come from the central part of Nepal, or parallelly, I can say that the capital part of country. Uh, we have centralized, we have had centralized government. Now we have federal system from 2012. And in Nepal, the pharmacy system was never given a priority. Uh, since some years, we are getting some priorities. And so government has documented 
98 type of free medicine from all health facilities. But like in other places, like the previous panelists told that there are very low procurement or there are not a proper procurement uh, according to the target population and we can't get fully 98 type of free medicine from our um, health facility and the most our uh, health um, costing is from out of the pocket expenditure so people have to pay huge amount of money and the majority of Nepal has the same scenario as that of this region because this represents Bagmati province especially represents the central of the um, country that means capital city is also lagging that means the outer periphery is already been in the track of lacking uh, we have some examples which i want to deliver here and uh, this example will help us know what is the situation right now in our country if a mother brings her child to the health facility in case of diarrhea only then we are we don't treat we usually don't have practice to treat with ors and zinc we despite give an antibiotic metronidazole uh, and we all know that um, metronidazole will cost more than that of zinc and ors and community pharmacies are playing one of the vital role in that in that and other in other cases like if a pregnant woman comes to the birthing center where she needs oxytocin uh, but due to the lack of proper storage facility the temperature is so high in some places and so low in some places uh, so the improper management of the stock improper management of the storage makes the deterioration of the quality of the oxytocin in case of scabies in case of cough and cold antibiotic are preferred more and leveling of the medicines is one of the biggest problem because pharmacists, uh, there are no pharmacists um, or very less pharmacists in our country and the less pharmacists, there are less knowledges about the medicine. When we give three um, TDS for a medicine, that is three times a day, then the medicine is taken, then three, three types of medicine in three times a day and which is very confusing to the people and um, moreover, that that when uh, there are many illiterate people in Nepal, because uh, majority of our male are working abroad, and um, they the left behind are women and children, and therefore MNCH healthcare is more needed in this country. So, in the in Nepal, the Ministry of Health and Population implemented a program that was with the coordination of MTAPS that the strategy was sparse supervision, performance, assessment and recognition strategy, which had five parts that was stock management. And that helped a lot. Stock management was one of the backbone for us. Now we have we have been using bean cards. Majorly sparse was implemented in four districts out of 13 districts in Bagmati province. And in out of five domains, there were stock management, storage management, ordering and reporting, prescribing, dispensing. There were improvement of 123, 125% in only three visits. Only three visits we could make the progress more than 100%. And if we had done that more often, then it would be, have been 200 to 300% improvement, and which would be very great for our province also. In Bagmati province, the supervision made the bin card uh, to be used. And now we know how, when the medicine is going to be finished, when to reorder it, how the storage is to be managed, the prescribing part majorly. The, um, those people who are not literate, you know, sparse had given us leaflet, or we can say the envelope, which, which had three signs, the rising of the sun, the daytime of the sun, and the evening of the sun, that is the dawn. And the three part were very clear. They, the people should not read anything. Just seeing the pictures, they would understand when to take the medicine. And the leveling part was done very good. And I appreciate Sparse for our MTOPS program for making such a good initiative. In Bagmati province, I have seen that Sparse has 
made maximum changes like ORS and zinc is being used right now. And many healthcare workers are trained and thanks to incentive of for their for the healthcare worker, which make them more workful. And the incentive they were getting, they had done all the respective works they were given and quantification and forecasting for the medicine is being done by help of USAID in local level, provincial level, and in the central level too. There are uh, many stories, how the stories can be done, while how the temperature is to be monitored. Everything was there in 25 domains of uh, five major, five domain, uh, sorry, 25 domains of five major aspects in sparse and thank we are very thankful for sparse for providing opportunity and moreover we are looking forward that amtaps will again be reconsidering to start sparse in more nine districts and more health facility might be getting those programs hopefully thank you ma'am and thank you very much uh, okay, thank you, Mr. Dalal. Thank you very much. That was a, a really good overview of, of, of some of those hands on problems of affordability of use and quality of products. And this quality improvement approach that um, was set up in the province where you are and some others to really have an, an amazing effect, it seems, on prescribing and on labeling, which is very important to make sure that the child or the, 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 the patient, but particularly child in this context that we're talking about, gets the treatment in, in the right way. And it's an impressive result that you were sharing. Um, it also highlights the, um, the, the problem of, of things taking time to roll out and the strengthening of the system is, is, is a slow process. So thank you very much for that. Moving on, because I know that the clock is ticking. John, over to you. Um, too many children under five are dying of pneumonia. We know what works. How does a strong pharmaceutical system affect the management of a sick child with pneumonia? Tell us more about it from your perspective, please. Well, thanks. Thanks, Jane. Thanks all. Thanks for that question. And thanks for the opportunity to take part today and to learn about the great work going on in Nepal and Rwanda. And uh, thanks to all of you who've joined. We've got, looks like we've got over a hundred participants on the lines. So that's great. So as has been noted by some of the other speakers, too many children are dying from preventable causes. We know that uh, most all countries have committed to reducing under five mortality to 25 or fewer deaths per thousand live births by 2030. And while most countries of the world have actually achieved that target, there are 54 countries off that are off track. And this is a result of both stagnation and reduction in newborn mortality, as well as mortality one to 59 months. And we know that beyond the newborn period, pneumonia remains the leading cause of death. Multi-factor, the, the, the pneumonia outcome, whether a positive one like recovery or an extremely negative one like death uh, is a result of multiple factors, including nutritional status, environmental factors, vaccination status now increasingly with the rollout of PCV vaccine. But once a child is ill with fever, we know that prompt diagnosis and treatment is absolutely critical. We have established algorithms, globally accepted, country implemented, uh, uh, country implemented algorithms for addressing this prompt diagnosis and treatment. Uh, we have the Integrated Management of Childhood Illnesses, IMCI, inclusive of its community component, component most manifested as Integrated Community Case Management, ICCM, which takes into consideration across the board, malaria, pneumonia, diarrhea, and undernutrition. And this is an established evidence-based approach, but the successful delivery of that approach, IMCI and ICCM, requires that there are multiple systems all working effectively together to deliver quality and timely services. These include health promotion to ensure that children requiring care are brought to care without delay, both primary care and referral care as needed community-based services, including not only community-based treatment for uncomplicated cases, but also recognition of danger signs and risk factors with prompt referral, and having well-trained staff at the facility level, and also importantly, with a manageable workload. And there's a way that ties back into pharmaceutical system strengthening. 
both this community care that has proven so critical in low resource settings to delivering that promise of child survival, indeed the countries that are on track, the low resource countries that are on track to achieve that overall under five mortality target that I spoke about earlier, you know, have all, one of the things they have in common is they all have very effective community level health services, including treatment of these common childhood illnesses. And as well, and as an end effective facility-based care, both primary care and hospital care rely critically on the availability of essential pharmaceuticals. For pneumonia, the most critical of these, as has been discussed, is amoxicillin in an appropriate pediatric formulation. We don't want too many, you know, we don't want uh, people out there breaking up little capsules of adult amoxicillin and trying to treat kids with them. And also, as was noted and has come up uh, with, you know, further discussion in the, ch in the chat, the, uh, a quality product. We know that there's too, there's too, there are too many medicines that are essentially either expired or have questionable efficacy and that this has real consequences. And Joseph, I know, has been going back and forth in the chat on re reinforcing some of these consequences. And it's not just amoxicillin, as was noted by Dr. Aline. There are other important pieces of both a the other, other, other treatment and as well as other diagnostics that are increasingly important and present for, our, for, them, for dealing with severe cases of pneumonia. We have new entry points for medical oxygen. This was seeded by the COVID response and we've, and now there's ongoing interest in helping to strengthen uh, neonatal intensive care with oxygen. But we also know this is a, that this is, as a medical commodity, it's important for the critical care of children in hospitals with severe pneumonia. And, and increasingly we are, you know, the diagnostics uh, around pneumonia is, is evolving rapidly with increasing interest and availability of pulse oximetry, uh, pulse oximetry to give us really a very, a very uh, concrete assessment of risks for children. So the, the gap, and a gap in the uh, in a critical commodity. Let's talk about the, the one we just mentioned, the most basic one, which is actually effective treatment with amoxicillin, can have consequences for other parts of the system. So I'm going to just relay a little bit of a story. Uh, last April, I had the opportunity to visit a rural health center in Kabwe District in Central Province in Zambia. And it was an amazing small facility. It had a it had, it had a catchment of about 1,700 households, about 6,000 people. The nurse midwife who was staffing this facility has was working essentially alone, and she had been there since 2015. She was actually one of the longest serving nurse midwives in that province, uh, well, at least in that district in in Zambia, and. She had had not really taken a break. She'd taken one break to get one to get married and one break to have her child. And otherwise she had been staffing this on her. And she had no community health assistance to actually help her with outreach. So every every all the services were being delivered at the facility itself. She did about seven deliveries a month, very successfully, had had no deaths at, at her facility. And so here you have someone who is incredibly committed. She was well trained. She'd had all the she was up to date on all the trainings that were relevant to the kind of care she had to provide. She followed established policy and the policy was well established on how to treat pneumonia. She knew what to do. She wanted to do it. But she had had not she had not had any amoxicillin in 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 memory. Uh, she had plenty of ACTs to treat malaria. But she had had, but but for, but for amoxicillin, but for pneumonia, if she had a child that required treatment with antibiotics, she and she inevitably had to refer them to the uh, Cobway Women's Newborns and Children Hospital, which was about an hour's ride away over a rough road for treatment. So this has a couple of consequences. One is that there's over referral to the hospital unnecessarily, and it strains the it strains the hospital resources, and. It also results in people of some people deciding ultimately to bypass primary care and go directly to hospitals when they when they really don't need to. So I think that we've got um, that gap. So that gap in amoxicillin at the community level had this rollover consequence for the treatment at at the hospital level. 
And it was a similar story in other places I visit. I also went to an urban health center in Sierra Leone. and It was the same story. They had lots of ACTs for malaria, but no amoxicillin to treat pneumonia. And they, it was urban area, so they would essentially give a prescription for pneumonia, uh, I'm sorry, for amoxicillin. And you know, looking at the last, uh, slot, the last photos that Jane had shared earlier, uh, you know, where do you want to be getting your drugs? So in some ways, uh, I just want to highlight this as an unacceptable consequence of focusing on vertical supply chains. We have a supply chain for malaria drugs, for example, and it seems to work because it's well resourced. But if we do that, then we're missing the opportunity to have comprehensive pharmaceuticals, a, ph a comprehensive pharmaceutical system strengthening approach. And I want to come back to that point later. Thanks very much. Great, thank you very much, John. Some some really important points there, and, and a really nice story um, from Zambia to really to really take it home. So thank you for that, and and again, thank you for stressing um, oxygen and pulse oximetry as an important part of the the system. Um, we're not just talking about medicines. So I'm going to move on now to the second phase of of questions, um, and this is all around um, what we need to do to move forward. Um, and so I think. You know, there has been um, a lot that's been done in strengthening systems, pharmaceutical systems, um, and this is not just by MTAPs, obviously, but other implementing partners. We've talked about the need for regulatory system strengthening. Much has been done to streamline registration processes, um, to put um, electronic systems for improved efficiency and registration in, in, in a number of countries. It was mentioned in Rwanda, has also happened in Nepal, Bangladesh, Madagascar, others. WHO has a system to benchmark regulatory systems to help countries define what they need to do to, to improve all of this to really minimize the likelihood of, of another scandal like that cough medicine scandal that we saw. A lot of work has been done on quantification across a number of different partners, updated tools to facilitate that, particularly challenging from MNCH, particularly where there's new medicines coming in. For example, we have tranexamic acid now being introduced to treat um, postpartum hemorrhage. Um, a lot of uh, discussions about um, procurement, um, particularly in the case of Nepal, we've we've heard of the um, subnational levels of procurement, and there are challenges around that. So there's um, work that has been done around this area. Joseph talked about the, the problem of, of, of scale up of amoxicillin and funding being one of those barriers. Global Fund recently announced that they would now consider funding non-malaria commodities, including amoxicillin, for this community package that John talked about, the integrated community case management. Um, so lots of things have been done to strengthen the pharmaceutical system in different ways. And we've just touched on a few there. I, I, I do want to leave time for questions at the end. Um, so do feel free to add in the chat if you have other um, ideas of successes that you're aware of to strengthen pharmaceutical systems in your countries. But there's still a lot to be done. Um, we saw what happened in the Gambia recently. We need better coordination between all the different stakeholders in countries and an understanding from donors that this is not a quick fix type activity. You can't just revise a guideline that's going to fix subnational procurement, but it's a, a longer set of policy and legal changes that is needed. And we need to do a better job of, of showing that a stronger health system does improve health outcomes. So how we can connect pharmaceutical system strengthening indicators to morbidity, mortality, and, and lives saved. And I think there was a question along those lines in the chat. So turning back to our panelists, um, Dr. Aline, first, um, what do you see as a key challenge in assuring the provision of quality MNCH services? And how is um, PSS critical for, for, for addressing that challenge moving forward? Oh, thank you. Uh, what we can say in terms of this uh, challenge in assuring quality provision of MNCH services. So uh, what I can say, uh, Rwanda, like other low middle income countries, so they are facing issue with substandard of falsified medicine, including those used in maternal, neonatal, and new and child health. So one notable challenge we can say pertaining to the absence of regular spot checks for quality control of commodities. And this deficiency may pose risk to the efficacy and safety of, of pharmaceutical products within the supply chain. So uh, what we I can say for Rwanda with the establishment of post-market surveillance uh, with uh, Rwanda 
Food Drug Administration. And with that one, those uh, regular spot check is being done. So a batch of misoprostol uh, was recorded from the Rwanda markets after suspecting the problem with its effectiveness. Then the tests were done to see if the drug is uh, substandard, which uh, the test was, which confirms that the product was substandard and withdraw from the market. This monitoring of quality is particularly very important in the context of NMCH, like other uh, pharmaceutical products, where the well-being of mother and children is directly dependent on quality of care commodities. So stock out and high price is another challenge resulting from the lack of local manufacturer, which it comes to spe special population when uh, uh, we are dealing with neonats. And as you know, those machines products are very important and the price and manufacturing is another issue. For what I can say also for pharmaceutical strengthening, uh, system in materno and is very important as we said so to address those challenge it's very important to continue working in collaboration with different uh, partners we are dealing with pharma the pharmaceuticals such as mtaps and psm global and also rwanda fda which is dealing with regulation locally and we do have this uh, one umbrella where they are gathering together to look on this quality. And uh, as MTAP also continues to support the strengthening pharmaceutical regulatory system to conduct this post-market surveillance, registration and safety of products will improve the quality of MNTH products on the Rwanda market and elsewhere. So Rwanda FD also is implementing structured training program tennis. So we have quality skills, knowledge of quality, Oh, and also has providers who are using that, reinforcing the pharmacovigilance system, establishing a pharmaceutical quality control policy, then implementing all those uh, quality plans. So we have a regular checks, which is uh, an, also a plan to do all this. This much, uh, facet strategy aim to enhance uh, the overall quality control framework and ensure that we do have uh, uh, efficacy and safety products for this will improve access and also services for better health outcome of all we are doing in terms of preventing diseases or controlling that. Con continuous capacity building to the MNCH support staff also is important and this will help to maintain and streamline the supply chain of availability to avail products in all the, through this different initiation, structured training of program, uh, emphasize skill enhancement. There is also knowledge development while sharing. Also this webinar is another opportunity where people learn and share uh, experience, expertise in different domains. So people can learn if it's also something which is planned regularly to be supporting us. Additionally, there is a focus on strengthening logistic management, information system through different uh, technology driven uh, solution. We do have integration of this through uh, technology and where people send their requests through like, online and this issue has commodity needs, it's known the national robust pharmaceutical strengthening policy then which is very key component to optimize process and ensure an efficiency and resilience in health supply chain. All this with those regular meetings, which is happening, calling, you know, the stock of month available, risk of stock, risk of SPR, it is, it's looked uh, ahead of time, we have a clear plan. This is help to have quality drug on time and where it is needed. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you very much. And again, you've raised the issue of, um, of quality as a challenge um, and you can't be assured of an outcome of, of treatment if you haven't got quality products and, and a nice example of, of post-market surveillance uh, being used and, and how the Rwanda FDA were able to take action as a result.
and you highlighted some ongoing um, areas that still need um, work on and building the capacity of the regulatory authority and and also working on strengthening those um, LMIS systems through through the use of technology so that you can have um, better uh, uh, procurement um, is linked to, to demand. So thank you for highlighting some of those those key points. Um, we are running short of time in order to um, address some of the questions that are coming up in the chat. So I want to keep us moving. Uh, Mr. Dalal, the same question to you really, to get your perspective from, from Nepal. What do you see as the challenge in Nepal in assuring provision of quality MNCH services and how critical is, is, is pharmaceutical system strengthening to address that? Ma'am, in case of Nepal, there are many national and international companies with their medicines and the product quality is being ensured by Department of Drug Administration. But uh, illegal market are there which through which illegal medicines comes very much. So ensuring the quality of product is still very challenging. Due to the lack of resources, thermoliable medicine like tetanus, oxytocin don't have maintained cold chain in Nepal. So efficacy of the medicine cannot be assured before giving to the patient. Storage management was in worst condition somewhat uh, in some districts now it has been more made more better with uh, the, those indicators those points which were the goals guiding documents which are being made day and day by day by different development partners now local level government is there uh, which is more concerned regarding the quality of medicine and GDA has made a lot of changes in the re registration system that is drug administration is there which is making change in the registration system and there is good storage and distribution practice guideline for wholesaler in public and private sector. Procurement is done at very different levels and implementing these practices are still very critical because it is a hilly area and every time the supervision or that of investigation can be done in each and every community pharmacy. Like you said in the first part that when Joseph sir used to go to some place, then there will be close of all the pharmacies. Like same sort of things is in, in Nepal. When DDA comes and invigilate in here, maximum shops get. You've gone on mute, Mr. Jalal. We can't hear you. You, you touched your mute button. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Got you back. Thank you. No problem. When Joseph Sir, like Joseph Sir told us that when he would visit some places, then they would close their searches and they would have been shut down. Like that, the ON Department of Drug Administration of Nepal visits different places of Nepal. Then there is also shut down in different clinics because they are afraid of getting caught of illegal medicines and without being. Uh, licensed practitioner, they practice the medicine. That those sort of um, problems are there. Amtrap has developed specifications for one hundred fifty-two medicine and for supplies for basic healthcare that are used in procurement, and which is majorly helping uh, to get quality of medicine eventually for helping mother and children children's health. Taking um, the case of diarrhea, inappropriate use of antibiotics, especially metronazole, and so on are more common in here and not only from the prescriber point of view from the people are also less aware about the adverse effect of antibiotic and majorly uh, stock management majorly every other management intervention is new and there are many positive points of sparse we are thankful to our uh, amtaps for creating such a program and Hopefully, those, if those will continue for a long time or if it continue for a short time also for two to five years, if it will be for five years plan, then government might um, be actively taking part of uh, our ownership of those and it will be um, definitely be getting better and better day by day. I think Nepal will be doing better if there is so support from some sources. Thank you, ma'am. Great. Thank you very much. And I think you've you've highlighted some real issues around quality, that it's not just the products, quality from the manufacturer that we need to be concerned about, but those storage challenges. And I think we were talking earlier about 
storage challenges where you've got facilities with tin roofs and it gets very hot. Um, and so there's obviously different ways of, of mitigating this problem. You touched on the work of the, the DDA to improve um, registration, but also the storage and distribution practices. And I know that there's been a, a lot of work in Nepal looking at improving that as well as subnational procurement. And again, you highlighted the SPARS strategy and, and the interest of the local government to, to expand that beyond its pilot stage that was possible to, to implement under the, under the project. So thank you um, very much for that. John, over to you. Um, the clock is still ticking, but the same question, I guess. You know, What do you see as a challenge in, in assuring provision of quality MNCH services? You touched a little on that earlier, but how critical um, is pharmaceutical system strengthening for addressing those challenges? Okay, Gina, I'll try to be uh, compact. So we know that the quality outcome is the result of multiple systems working effectively together. In fact, beyond the systems that are in the snake diagram that you presented earlier. Uh, for IMCI, and this is one of the areas where under the Momentum Project, we're focusing both at global level, working with uh, WHO and UNICEF, and regional level as well with those, but also an important piece of actual practically trying to improve quality of care, quality of care for, in, for pediatric quality of care uh, at country level. Still, you know, we talk about um, when we think about an outcome we're trying to get to, we often think about systems bottlenecks. And we know that pharmaceutical system strengthening is an absolutely critical piece of this. But it's and it's and it's critical because we want to have that quality of product, quality product available when and where we need it. But while it is necessary, it's not sufficient to ensure quality of care. We need to look at all of the systems that have to contribute. So this means that we're looking across diverse endpoints, maternal health, newborn health, immunization, malaria programs, et cetera. Um, and all of these consider pharmaceutical system strengthening as a component of what they're trying to actually address to deliver quality of care. The skill sets, the approaches, some of the equipment required overlap. There are, for example, quality improvement teams at facility level that try to address multiple issues. Some of the issues that relate to specifically to, to commodities related to forecasting, procurement, and warehousing. There are substantial overlaps. There aren't separate warehouses for different commodities. Um, but coordination is not about, for example, in my view, a child health unit acting alone to address some of these systems challenges but rather to look at how they're integrated with the uh, integrated with all the other needs. There are specific capabilities, though, that child health uh, focused units need to have. It's not just those working on pharmaceutical supply. They, they, they would have a forecast, for example, just for amoxicillin, but they have to be able to ensure that they can think and advocate for not only those appropriate pediatric formula formulations, but also appropriate use. So those child health units, they have to advocate for what they need, but it has to be to this broad in, within the context of this broader system. And so one of the reasons I think that my observation has been that the, one of the reasons that malaria commodities seem to be to better reach the points in the points in this in the whole health system that they need to reach is that there simply is a human being who is paying close attention to forecasting, quantification, procurement, and distribution of those malaria commodities. And what you need is, to, and they're doing that within the context of the broader pharmaceutical system strengthening that, you've, that we've been discussing today. But we've got to actually make sure that those other commodities, the ones that we need for child health, are also getting the same kind of attention. And sometimes they're not just because there's not a person who's been paid to actually ensure that that's happening. So I'll stop there, thanks. Yeah, and I think that's an important point that the, the child health unit can't do this on their own, and they 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 need to be coordinated with other with other units to ensure quality amoxicillin is financed, procured, distributed, prescribed, and used appropriately. And and they need a voice. So the child health people need a voice with all these other actors to really promote um, that that the, the, the system is is used for um, appropriately for for ensuring the outcomes that they need. Um, Joseph, to wrap up this last um, round of questions before we open up to the questions coming in from, from the um, people on the call, to you, what results do you want to see in maternal newborn child health as a result of pharmaceutical system strengthening and what are the challenges? Thank you, Jane. Uh, results we'd like to see, 
that mothers and babies don't die from conditions that are preventable and treatable. Uh, for, for us, that's the bottom line. And for us as individuals, that our job as public health professionals in supporting maternal, newborn, and child health does not end with procurement and distribution of medicines. I, I would like to refer to Jane's presentation earlier. Uh, I don't know if it can be projected. Uh, there was this, yes, this pharmaceutical system component diagram. You would see that there are many, many stages in the process of getting medicines to the end user and in making sure it is used appropriately. And you can look at this as a chain. And you know what they say, that a chain is as strong as its weakest link. If any of those joints in the chain is broken, then you have a broken system. And sometimes those actions can have catastrophic consequences. So unfortunately, investments in pharmaceutical system are much more longer term as they don't show quick results. And so, uh, because when you prioritize pharmaceutical systems strengthening, the results might not immediately show. And one, what, what has been said is that one of the hardest things to measure is the absence of disaster. And I will just illustrate it with an unfortunate event that happened some years back in Nigeria. In 2009, 85 children died from ingesting a brand of titan mixture called My Pekin. Now, imagine if the manufacturer had conducted back testing and discovered the contaminant before putting the product on the market. Or imagine that post-marketing surveillance had detected this much sooner. Those deaths might have been avoided. But then no one would have received any commendation for preventing those deaths as no one would know if those 84 lives have been saved. So it's important for us to recognize that investing in this are much more longer term. And if we don't, all of the other efforts would not bring us the desired result. And uh, I would encourage all of us who work in this space to see pharmaceutical systems strengthening as an important part in MNCH programming, given the importance of prevention and treatment to save the lives of uh, women and children, especially. Back to you, Jane. Great, thank you very much for, for wrapping up that question there, Joseph, with a reminder that what we want is a health outcome, so the reduction in child and maternal mortality, and that's only possible if the medicines are available, safe, quality, affordable, and used correctly. And I think it's true to say that medicines, equipments, and devices should be considered up front, right, in MNCH programming. They shouldn't be considered as, a, as an afterthought. So I, I see that there's been a fair amount of discussion and, and questions being put in the chat, but focusing on the, the panelists, I've not been able to look at all of them. So um, I'm going to ask my colleague Lauren to help guide um, uh, some of those questions so that people that have been writing can, can, can get some responses to their comments or their questions. Um, maybe, Alicia, we can take down the slide deck and we can put, um, uh, the panelists can put their cameras on and we can see what, um, what we've got. Lauren. Over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Jane. And also a very big thank you to our panelists for this great discussion. Um, let's see. Do I see our panelists coming back on camera here? Our panelists could, um, I'd invite you to put your cameras on as we turn to some of the questions we've been receiving in the chat. Great. I see Dr. Aline. I see Joseph. There's John. Great. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, there's been a lot of great questions in the chat. Just in the interest of time, I don't know that we'll have time to address all of them today, unfortunately, um, but excited to see your engagement in the chat. Um, perhaps we could start with this one. Um, I think several of our panelists have been talking about ensuring that we are prioritizing um, different medical products for MNCH. And so, um, for example, we just heard John talk about making sure there's sufficient coordination and attention for MNCH products, you know, financing, forecasting, procurement, et cetera. And in the chat, we had um, Tadele from Ethiopia 
noting that a budget for procuring RMNCH or reproductive maternal newborn and child health commodities is really a challenge in Ethiopia. So I wanted to see if any of our panelists would like to briefly comment on um, what they see as important for making sure that we can prioritize funding um, and attention specifically for MNCH medical products. Well, I could go first and then maybe sure. the ahead, other two could add. I think there are several opportunities. Uh, first, uh, you recall Jane mentioned earlier about Global Fund reviewing its guidance to allow countries to include non-malaria commodities. I think that is one opportunity. Also, uh, I think someone in the in the chat also mentioned why we should encourage pool procurement. I think that would also bring in efficiencies. What I also consider another option is the fact that we've seen in several countries, I don't know specifically about Ethiopia, for example, for amoxicillin, many countries continue to procure just the suspension without the dispersible. And we know in terms of the unit cost, it might actually be cheaper if you are using the dispersible, but many countries continue to procure this uh, suspension that limits how much quantity they can procure. And then finally, I would say that uh, the study that was done by MTAS on looking at registration, we've seen that in many countries, there are not enough uh, formulations in terms of options or choices for both the public and the private sector uh, to, 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 to sell or to, to dispense, mm -hmm. such that if there is a limited uh, quantity or limited variety in terms of the formulation. Sometimes there is just one brand or just one registered product that limits choice, that limits competition, and that could make the price to be high. So I think looking at these uh, options of expanding the options in terms of the variety, uh, looking at opportunities of leveraging other resources like the Global Fund and the pooled procurement, I think those are strategies that countries can adopt. And well, Ethiopia is actually one of the countries that has been able to improve access to amoxicillin and they've received commendation in that regard. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Joseph. You touched on several key areas there. Um, I wanted to see if any of our other panelists wanted to quickly comment on this before we move on. John, Dr. Aline or Dulal? I think Joseph covered it very well from the global perspective. Dr. Aline, I saw you also come off mute there. Yes, uh, thank you. So what I was uh, going to say is uh, the way we are doing it's to prioritizing to have all these MNCH products, as we have said, they are very critical. So what we do is we have a pool and uh, different uh, stakeholders who are uh, supporting the program in availing all these kind of commodities. And so we do have uh, USAID, we have uh, also uh, UNICEF, we have UNFPA, we do have um, uh, let's say also different like uh, recently we have been uh, also approached by MTAP to go for Global Fund as uh, Joseph was mentioning to be part of the grant to us for the non-malaria um, program. But, uh, and this have been attempt, but uh, unfortunately as also Global Fund is reducing his budget. So we are still looking at none away so it can be done, but uh, working together with all partners uh, operating in the same area so we try to streamline and have different do the quantification together and then after when we have finalized each and everyone put his uh, contribution then we made procurement of those uh, critical uh, products or equipment we, we need then upon arrival we distribute all together because we, we know the needs where we do need everywhere countrywide then as per the need we have, we have a distribution plan which is done and we uh, make an active distribution 
for all the place, then uh, availing the product. So the other thing is that we do have regular meetings where we gather together, technical working group where we do discuss different indicators, such as reduction of um, numbers of experience or uh, stock outs. Then after presenting also other indicators and reduction of deaths, maternal death. And we look on the specific uh, key area uh, factors which uh, made this uh, loss in, the, in, uh, in some health, see if it's maternal death or health. Then after that, then we can look at that. We say, okay, this has been happening. It could be avoidable if we have this in place. Then we plan together and we procure with uh, the fund we have put together and we have the products on time and we try to uh, save life. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for Dr. Dr. Aline and for highlighting a couple of key points there, including um, particularly the collaboration and coordination that you have in Rwanda and also the importance of data for decision making. Um, I wanted to move on to a different question that we received from Asha. So um, a couple of our panelists have talked about the many different components in the pharmaceutical system that need to work together to ensure access to appropriate quality assured medicines, and that's under ideal circumstances. Um, Asha wonders how different countries are dealing with ensuring access to a supply of essential medicines when um, conditions are not ideal. So for example, maybe during the rainy season or when there's um, those kind of seasonal challenges um, and maybe there's challenges with the roads or overall supply is disrupted because of infrastructure issues. Um, so I wondered if any of our panelists wanted to comment on that. Um, you know, perhaps Dulal, I know you're at the provincial level, so perhaps you have a comment on that. Um, so maybe we can start with you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Majorly, our place is maximum part of the hills are there. So definitely the natural calamities and other things regularly hampers. But we have three, three system of um, procurement. That is, central level has certain level of... Uh, central level only can procure few medicines and provincial can procure few and local level government can procure few so local level local local level government provides the maximum medicines from the central warehouse and provincial warehouse uh, through the district warehouse so from the central warehouse it goes to the provincial and from provincial to the district and so from the district to uh, local level so they procure and they um, have stock in there, in them, uh, before some, uh, they have amount of stock, which can be used during that period, and that is how it is being going on, and during calamities or during um, our harsh time, we can say it. Uh, the in harsh time, we usually um, provide medicines through different means. Mm -hmm. In the COVID period, when there. <laughs> Go, with COVID, there was the weather condition, and at that period, some local level governments put the um, way of um, chartering helicopters and giving medicines to there, and that was all done in that crucial day. Great. Thanks so much, for Dulal, for sharing your experience from the provincial level in Nepal. Um, I don't know if any of our other speakers want to quickly touch on that before we move forward from a different perspective. Yeah, I would like to just say a couple of things. Uh, thank you, Dua. Uh, I think there are two, two possibilities. So if it's, for example, like an unplanned shock, uh, I think that would then uh, would be something that we encourage countries to have what we call like resilient planning. You have to have eventualities that you, you 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 predict ahead of time and say what will you do if this kind of situation happens it's part of the lessons from covid that you, you don't want to respond only when it occurs you need to anticipate that this kind of situations could occur in which case you have to have a plan in place long before it happens 
to say if this kind of situation happens, what are the measures I can take to mitigate uh, a supply challenge uh, for my medicines? That's one. But let's say it's a seasonal thing that happens every year. I think there are still two options. Either you look at it, if it happens, what are we going to do? You have to plan ahead. Or in the other way, you factor that into your forecasting and procurement planning and your quantification to say, if, for example, uh, in the rainy season, this place is inaccessible, then you know that they might need enough medicines for that period when you can't deliver supplies. Then you factor that into your quantification, into your forecasting and your supply plan. Over. Maybe just to add to Joseph's comment, I think, you know, that that's exactly right. And the purpose of strengthening a pharmaceutical system is that it is strong and resilient. And so it's it's ready to resist those kinds of shocks um, with preparation and and, and the, the, the strength of the system itself. So I think that that's another indication or justification for, for really focusing on strengthening those systems. Thanks, Larry. I just wanted to come in with one additional okay. comment because picking uh, picking up on the issue of accessibility, it's not, in my view, it's not just the accessibility to be able to deliver supplies to facilities, but also to take in mind that sometimes facilities become more inaccessible to those who need the services of the facilities, which is why having these community-based services and making sure that those workers are also supplied well is actually a quite critical piece of ensuring resilience. Over. Great point, John. Thank you for adding that. Um, we're coming to a close, so let's see if we have time for one quick last question. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit on regulatory systems just because I know that I saw a lot of different comments in the chat um, in response to our panelists talking about different elements of regulatory systems. I know that we heard from Dr. Aline who talked about how in Rwanda they had identified a substandard product and actually recalled it from the market. We heard from Jane about the example in the Gambia and um, also from Dulal about sometimes not being able to, uh, you know, ensure the quality of some products that are received. Um, so I know that, you know, there have been a lot of successes and there seems to be um, increasing awareness of the importance of, of regulatory systems, but just wanted to see if any of our speakers could, could quickly comment on um, just making sure that we are prioritizing regulatory systems as part of the pharmaceutical system and, and ensuring that we try to um, reduce any more cases like in the Gambia. Any of our speakers want to quickly comment on regulatory systems? Yeah, I could say a couple of things. Uh, USAID through its uh, various mechanisms have been supporting uh, regulations of medicines and of medical devices in several countries. For example, the MTAP program, Medicines, Technology and Pharmaceutical Strengthening, has supported uh, uh, regulatory agencies to improve registration of medicines and quality assurance. And then the promoting quality of medicines has worked in several countries, building the capacity of our uh, regulatory institutions. But of course, USAID's resources are limited. We cannot go to every country and we cannot also cover every medicine and every device because for each medicine, there is a whole set of principles and steps you need to take to have quality assured uh, products. So because the resources are limited, it's important that uh, governments also invest in their own regulatory institutions. We, we have history of partnerships in many countries, especially in Africa, we are, even in Asia, where we have worked closely with regulatory institutions to improve quality assurance of medicines. And even more recently, we are working to expand that sphere to the area of uh, medical devices and equipment. I, I'm sure Jane will probably have something to add to that. Great. Thank you so much, Joseph. I wish we had time to get to all the questions. Um, thank you so much to our participants for engaging so much in the chat throughout this webinar. Um, again, a huge thank you to our panelists for sharing their experiences today. Um, and I wanted to hand it back over to my colleague, Jane, for some final remarks. It's a shame we couldn't keep going. I know um, there's some really interesting discussions just getting started there, but um, 
I, I think it is time to wrap up. Um, thank you to everybody for joining us today and uh, especially a huge thank you to our panelists. It's been quite a journey from Washington DC to the hills of Rwanda and the mountains of Nepal. But I think, you know, we've made it clear that even though interventions to strengthen the pharmaceutical system help improve access to appropriate and appropriate use of essential medicines and medical products in general, we have to really focus on that being uh, applicable to, to MNCH products, so amoxicillin, oxytocin, and that these interventions need investment by both country governments, um, as, be, as has been mentioned, and also um, donors, but they, they do take time. We've heard a lot about the importance of considering the quality of products, not just from a regulatory standpoint, but also through the, the storage and distribution practices with, with the challenge of, of the thermolabile product of, of oxytocin. And many other points that have come up, looking at the different domains of pharmaceutical system strengthening. A lot's been done, but there is still more to do and coordination is um, really uh, key. We want to shift our thinking from the role of MNCH medicines in health systems as being an input, to the structures and processes within the broader system that help us to ensure those affordable quality assured products are accessible and used appropriately. Um, so instead of saying no product, no program, we would want to say no quality product used appropriately, no improved health outcomes. And as Joseph said, the outcomes we want are to save the lives of mothers and babies from conditions that are preventable and treatable. So thank you all very much for joining us today. Um, that's it. And we will be sharing the recording of this webinar um, in due course. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Bye. Thank you, thank you all. Bye, everyone. Bye.